Welcome to the Delmarva Almanac. Each week, we connect you to the best of Delmarva. I'm your host, Dana Kester McCabe. This past week was the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. So we thought it was a good time to tell you a bit about the history of what is currently Delmarva's only national park, Assateague Island National Seashore. I say currently because it will be the only national park on the peninsula until the Harriet Tubman Park opens up in Dorchester County next year. Assateague Island is 37 miles long, and it's actually home to three separately managed parks. The story of how it got divvied up goes back a few hundred years. The earliest European maps do not even show Assateague. At most, they have indications of shifting sandbars. Assateague, for much of its history, has actually been a series of islands rather than one contiguous one. Washovers happened up and down the barrier island. These naturally forming inlets would sometimes persist in the same locations, but often they did not. Three recurring inlets between Ocean City's current inlet and the Shingatig Inlet were called Sinopuxent, Green Run, and Pope's Island. The name Assateague has been assigned a few different meanings. The river beyond a place across, a running stream between, or swiftly moving water. It is also the name given to the tribes living in the region at the time of the European invasion. These tribes had lived here for over 300 years before the appearance of white explorers. They were thought to have lived on the island itself, but records of those early travelers show that they only summered there and wintered across the inland bays in villages that were less exposed to the harsh winters along the ocean. When they came to the island, they were not vacationing. They were working hard catching and preserving fish and other wildlife for the winter. The mollusks, fish, deer, ducks, and other waterfowl they caught were smoked over big fires and transported in baskets back to the mainland, where they were buried in underground caches for use all winter long. The tribes saw the island as part of their territory, but not necessarily as property. British King Charles made Assateague Island a part of the Maryland Charter granted to Lord Baltimore's Cecil Calvert in 1632. After that, relations with the native peoples were somewhat reasonable, though deteriorating, when in the early 1660s, one Colonel Edmund Scarborough led a campaign to usurp Maryland's eastern shore counties for his own home colony of Virginia. His strategy was to foment distrust and outright hostility between English settlers and the native tribes. His troops would then come in to save the day, and by virtue of his military accomplishment, he thought he could lay claim to the land for Virginia. The king, or emperor of the Assateagues by this time, was the leader of a band of several tribes from present-day Worcester and Somerset County. He petitioned the courts in Maryland for help. In 1668, Scarborough gave up his quest and signed an agreement with the Calvert government, acknowledging the present border between the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia. But by then, the die was cast, and most of the so-called Indian tribes were being systematically pushed out of the region. By the 1680s, a land grant on Assateague Island was given to English settlers Captain Daniel Jennifer and his wife Anne Toft at the southern end of the island. In 1702, Captain William Whittington was given a grant on the northern end. He called his patent Baltimore's Gift, and he used the land for livestock grazing. As early as 1715, Captain Whittington subdivided his portion of the north end of the island into lots for sale. Homesteaders who bought them mostly did not prosper, and they were abandoned. The legend of the island's famous ponies coming from a Spanish ship may have started with the story of a frigate called the Greyhound, which sank just off Assateague September 6, 1750. After running aground very close to the beach in foul weather, the ship's crew unloaded their most valuable cargo, several chests of Spanish silver. As the weather started to let up, they dragged dories and the silver across the dunes and made their way across the inland bays to the mainland. Almost as soon as they landed safely on the other side, local wreckers were stripping the greyhound of anything else of value. Wrecks along the coast of Assateague were frequent enough that scavenging opportunities attracted permanent residents to the small villages now developing there. Locals called these folks wreckers. They took the remaining cargo of mahogany from the greyhound, the personal belongings of the crew, the boat's hardware and fittings, and even some of the wooden timbers and decking of the boat itself. 
By this time, the ship's captain, Daniel Hwani, had made his way to Snow Hill, where he complained bitterly to the local authorities. This incident, and many others like it, led to the passage of maritime salvage laws. At that time, a story began to circulate that there were also horses aboard the Greyhound and that they had escaped during the storm. Some people supposed they were the start of the now famous herds of Assateague ponies. This is unlikely since Worcester County farmers had already been using the island for grazing their cows and horses for many years. The story about the Spanish horses may have been encouraged by livestock owners who wanted to cut down on taxes by minimizing the size of their herds. After the Civil War, a hotel was built at Green Run, and a development was underway at North Beach. Land speculators bought tracks and tried to sell off their lots. The storm of 1933, which created Ocean City's inlet, effectively doomed the existing villages south of it, cutting off access to supplies and the train bridge to the mainland, which was also destroyed. A movement began in 1935 to make the unstable island a park under the auspices of the still relatively young National Park Service. Virginia Congressman Otis Bland bought forth legislation to get things started. But Worcester County officials balked, so the initiative stalled. Development prospects on the southern end of the island were deemed unlikely, so landowners in Virginia sold most of their lots in 1943 to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They used money from the federal duck stamp program, buying the land for $75,000. That was park number one. In the 1950s, a retired New Yorker named William Green took up the cause to make the rest of the island a national park in order to, quote, save the island from the sea and honky-tonk, unquote. He joined with a committee of 46 fellow Worcester County residents and then a statewide group to convince local and state legislators that more tax revenue would be gained from a wildlife preserve and recreation area than from a development that would require continued expensive infrastructure costs. With nothing resolved, the next development boom began. The Ocean Beach Corporation bought up a large tract on Assateague and sold almost 6,000 lots to about 3,200 people. They connected the island to the county's electrical grid and improved the telephone lines. The project was dealt a fatal blow when the Great Ash Wednesday Nor'easter in March of 1962 washed over the island and destroyed the infrastructure that then existed. Out of 48 homes that had been built, only eight remained standing in the town that would have been called Ocean Beach, Maryland. After that disaster, the state of Maryland negotiated with the feds and the county to buy some portion of the island for their own park. Money was set aside to build what is now Assateague State Park on a tract that had been slated to become another Atlantic city. Now we had park number two. In 1965, the Ocean Beach Corporation cried uncle and sold all their property to the government. On September 21st of that year, President Lyndon Johnson signed an act of Congress creating the Assateague Island National Seashore, saying that we should leave future generations, quote, a glimpse of the world as God made it, not just as it looked when we got through with it, unquote. This gave us our third park on Assateague. It took almost another decade to negotiate and complete the purchase of the remaining tracts of land, including several hunting lodges on the island. Their owners got a special deal. They were paid for their properties and given up to 25 years to continue using them. That time period has now come and gone. Any of the buildings belonging to these gunning and fishing clubs that the Park Service did not use have been abandoned and allowed to, quote, naturally rot away, unquote. These ghost structures lie empty deep in the back country of the island, and only the most intrepid hikers venture out to find them. The shifting shoreline of Assateague continues to fascinate us with her natural beauty and wildlife. Who knows what the island will look like a hundred years from now? We can be grateful that whatever form it takes, someone in the not-too-distant past took the time to save Assateague for all of us to enjoy. For more information about this topic, visit our website, delmarvaalmanac.com slash history. Well, that's all for this edition of the Delmarva Almanac. Be sure to follow us on Facebook or Twitter, and next week join us to learn more about our local culture and get connected to our natural wonders. 
We'd like to thank our community partners, the Friends of Delmarva Public Radio, and our underwriters for their help in bringing this program to you, our audience. If you'd like to become an underwriter for this program, visit delmarvaalmanac.com support. Our theme music was provided by Brightside Studio. This show has been a Moonshell production. Thanks for listening. Until we meet again, may the rhythms and tides of Delmarva bring you good fortune.